Hi, my name is Mick Matthews and I'm the Senior Program Officer for the Network of Sex Work Projects, which is the Global Sex Worker Network. And I just want to welcome you to the um, first in the NSWP series, video series, called Global Fund Basics. So this video is going to be about an overview of the history of the Global Fund, how it's structured, how it works, the three civil society delegations, and the three standing committees. Let's start with the history of the Global Fund. The Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria was created in 2002 to raise, manage, and invest the world's money to respond to three of the deadliest infectious diseases the world has ever known. The mission of the Global Fund is to invest the world's money to defeat these three diseases. The idea for the Global Fund arose from a, a wellspring of grassroots political advocacy coming face to face with the imperatives of global leadership. AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria are all preventable and now they're all treatable. But solving this problem require commitment not only of world leaders and decision makers, but also of those working on the ground to help the men, women and children living with these diseases. It's important to remember that when Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, first proposed the idea of a global fund to world leaders, it was in response to the huge outcry from communities and civil society. Too many millions of people were dying from AIDS. Too many souls were being lost and business as usual was not working. Then Kofi Annan had his dream. The idea was first discussed at a G8 summit in Okinawa, Japan in the year 2000. The idea of a global fund began to come together at the African Union summit in April 2001 and continued at the United Nations General Assembly Special Session, the UNGAS, on AIDS in June 2001, and was finally endorsed at the G8 Summit in Genoa, Italy, in July 2001. And then the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria was born. Let's look at the first office. Once the idea of a global fund had been agreed, the next task was the massive undertaking to set up a global institution. An interim office and transitional working group, commonly referred to as the TWG, was established in Brussels, Belgium. Now this was a highly pressurized environment as they set about designing mechanisms to manage and disperse billions of the world's money. As part of the process of, to develop the principles and working modalities, the TWG funded a global civil society consultation. This included a worldwide electronic consultation and culminated in a global meeting of around 150 participants, which had a massive impact on how the global fund was set up and structured. The Global Fund Framework document is the founding document of the Global Fund and lays out its principles and its working modalities. And approximately 60% of the framework document emerged directly out of the civil society consultation process. So civil society and key populations have a massive stake in the Global Fund, unlike with any other global institution. The Global Fund is based on four fundamental principles. First, there is partnership. And that means partnership with the UN technical agencies, private sector, civil society, communities, all those involved in the response to the diseases should also be involved in the decision making. Then there's country ownership. Now, country ownership means that people determine their own solutions 
to fighting the three diseases. Each country tailors its response to the political, cultural and epidemiological context of that country. Unfortunately, this one is too often interpreted as government ownership and key populations, like sex workers, struggle to have an influence on decisions. But the principle is country ownership. The third principle is performance-based funding. That means programmes need to have proven, effective and time-bound results in order to receive continued funding. Local fund agents, or LFAs as they are known, monitor and verify programme for performance and results. And the final principle is transparency. The Global Fund operates with a high degree of transparency in all of its work, including applications for funding, funding decisions, grant performance, results, governance and oversight. And all audits and investigations by the Office of the Inspector General, or the OIG, are openly published on the website. So the Global Fund is a really transparent organisation compared to what we were used to. It's not perfect, but it is very transparent. So then there's the core structures of the Global Fund. First, there's the board. The board sets strategy, governs the institution, and it approves all funding decisions. It is also responsible for assessing organizational performance, including the performance of the executive director, and overall risk management, partner engagement, resource mobilization, and to some degree, advocacy. Then there is the country coordinating mechanisms, or CCMs, as you probably refer to them. Each implementing country establishes a national committee or a country coordinating mechanism to submit funding requests on behalf of the entire country and to oversee implementation once the request has become a signed grant. CCMs should include representatives of every sector involved in the response to the diseases. Then there are the local fund agents that I've mentioned earlier, the LFAs. These are independent consultants who assess implementation and data. As the Global Fund does not have offices in country, LFAs serve as the eyes and ears of the Global Fund on the ground. Then you have the Office of the Inspector General, or OIG. The OIG is an independent body reporting directly to the Global Fund board. The OIG works to ensure that the Global Fund invests in the most effective way possible and to, and to reduce the risk of misused funds and other possible abuses, including human rights abuses within Global Fund grants. Then you have the principal recipients, or PRs. The PRs are responsible for implementing grants, including coordination of smaller organisations known as sub-recipients or even sub-sub-recipients. Principal recipients take on the financial as well as programmatic responsibilities of the grant. Then you have the staff of the Global Fund, and the staff are responsible for the day-to-day -day operations, and all staff are based in Geneva, Switzerland. And finally, there's the technical review panel. TRP. The TRP is an independent body of health, development and finance experts and the TRP evaluates the technical merit of all funding requests. Slide 6. Partnerships. And excuse the cat. This is how the board is structured. As you can see from the slide, it is split between donors and implementers. The other board members, such as UNAIDS, WHO, Stop TB, Rollback Malaria, etc., do not have a vote. 
Because seats are allocated on the donor side, based on the size of contribution to the fund, some seats are occupied by a single country, such as the US or the UK or France, while others are occupied by multiple countries or entities, such as the European Commission or private foundations or private sector. And they have a single seat and the board member usually rotates between the different entities within that particular partnership. The implementer side is regionally allocated plus the three civil society delegations. There are three civil society delegations, the developed country NGO delegation, the developing country NGO delegation, and the communities delegation. And what's important about this that you need to really understand is that these delegations each have the same voting rights and therefore the same power as any other de delegation around the board, around the table. So let's start with the communities delegation, which for me is the most important delegation. But the communities delegation members are drawn from communities living with and directly affected by the three diseases. The mission of the communities delegation is to ensure that the voices and issues of people living with and affected by HIV, tuberculosis or malaria influence the deliberations and decisions of the Global Fund to achieve greater and sustained impact for communities. And what that means is the communities delegation are working for you. They work for communities, they're of communities and they work for the communities. Then you have the developing country NGO delegation. The mission of this delegation is to seek to influence global fund policies and practices so that they are continually and appropriately responsive to the needs of those affected by AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria and for NGOs and community-based organisations in the Global South. So the developing country delegation has its main focus on the Global South. Finally, there's the developed country NGO delegation. Their mission is to bring the voices and needs of civil society to the Global Fund. Their broader constituency includes delegation members of non-governmental organizations based in Western Europe, the United States, Canada, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and international NGOs headquartered in developed countries. So, moving on to the board committees. There are three standing or permanent committees. There's the Strategy Committee, the Audit and Finance Committee, and the Ethics and Governance Committee. The standing committees enable the Global Fund Board to do its work. Each committee has delegated authority from the board so that they can make decisions and perform advisory and oversight functions in their specific areas. Really important decisions such as grant approvals, the Secretariat operating budget or approval of the strategy are brought to the full board for further discussion and final decision making. The coordination of the work of the board and the committees is managed by the coordinating group. And slide nine, this looks at the board committees and their functions. So the strategy committee is responsible for guiding the development of the next Global Fund strategy for 2023 and 2030. During implementation of each strategy, it provides oversight of the strategic direction of the Global Fund and ensures the optimal impact and performance of its investments in health. 
The Audit and Finance Committee, then its role is to ensure optimal performance of the corporate and financial operations of the Global Fund by providing oversight of the financial management of the fund's resources and the internal and external audit functions and it also oversees and provides guidance on all financial issues. And finally there's the Ethics and Governance Committee. The Ethics and Governance Committee ensures that the Global Fund and its stakeholders all adhere to appropriate standards of ethical behaviour. It oversees implementation of the procedures and the operations related to the Global Fund's governance structure and its core governance functions. And while Ethics and Governance Committee members are nominated by Global Fund constituencies, they actually serve in their personal capacity. Once a CCM submits a funding request on behalf of the country, it is reviewed by the Technical Review Panel, or TRP. This is an independent group of experts who do not receive a salary from the Global Fund. and They evaluate the funding request for technical merit and strategic focus. The TRP also has a role as an advisory body to the Global Fund Board in the development and implementation of the Global Fund strategy. Then there's the Grant Approvals Committee. After a funding request has successfully passed through the Technical Review Panel, it is then reviewed by the Grant Approvals Committee. The Grant Approvals Committee is a committee of senior Global Fund management, as well as representatives of civil society and communities, and technical, bilateral and multilateral partners. Among other functions, the Grant Approvals Committee reviews the final grant before recommending it to the Board of the Global Fund for final approval. And then there is the Global Fund Board. And the Global Fund Board reviews the recommendations from the Grant Approval Committee and makes decisions on funding a funding request. This is done most often via an email voting system, but sometimes face-to-face -face as well, depending on the situation. So that, very simply, very basic, it is the Global Fund basics after all, is how the Global Fund works and how it makes its funding decisions. The final slide, slide 11, are some contacts. There's the Global Fund website, which is really worth you spending time navigating and surfing on and seeing what information is there, because there is a lot of information on the Global Fund website. Not all of it translated um, into other languages, but, but there is quite a bit that is. The Communities Delegation have their own website, and you can see the, uh, the link. The Developing Country NGO Delegation and the Developed Country NGO Delegation both have their own websites also. And the final link is for the NSWP Smart Guide to the Global Fund. And that can be found on the NSWP website. So that brings us to the end um, of this video. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was interesting and um, I'll see you in the next video. All right, bye.